Hello everyone, my name is Maria. I'm the head of talent development at Betson Group and I'm also a doctoral researcher at the University of Glasgow. And today we'll moderate this panel, Diversity and Inclusion, It's Time to Think Outside the Tick Box. So today I'm joined by Kelly, the co-founder of the All-In Diversity Project. So please welcome her onto the stage. Thanks, Maria. And the next panelist is Ricky. She is the lead HR consultant and the chair of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Board at Better Collective. So please welcome her onto the stage. Thank you. So before we start, would you like to introduce yourselves? Yes, I can start. Yes, so uh, my name is Ricky and I am lead HR consultant at Better Collective and also the chair of the DI board. I was also one of the founders of the board, so started the whole uh, work with the DI. So I'm very happy to be here today and talk about this topic. Kelly? My name is Kelly Keen. I'm the co-founder of All In Diversity Project. I don't have the accolades that both of you have. Um, but, you know, I've been in this industry a long time, so I'm happy to talk about its people and where it's going. Perfect. Uh, so over the past couple of weeks, uh, we had the opportunity to meet virtually and discuss the topic of diversity and inclusion in more depth. So we decided that we would like to approach the topic from a slightly different perspective today in the sense that we will not talk about the benefits of diversity and inclusion, because we agreed that in this day and age, and given all the studies that have been conducted by major organizations out there, such as the World Economic Forum, McKinsey, the United Nations, the benefits and the necessity of diversity and inclusion is undeniable for any organization. So today we would like to talk about the how of diversity and inclusion. How can we ensure that diversity and inclusion does not become a box-ticking exercise uh, exclusively focused on ticking uh, diversity boxes in hiring, internal promotions, and so on. Uh, so with that being said, let's dive right into it. Um, and my first question is, um, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we often hear the term equality of opportunity. And what I see is that equality of opportunity is often being misused uh, to justify inequality of outcome. So my question is, what does equality of opportunity mean to you? And what do you think might be getting in the way of achieving it? Ricky? Yeah, so um, I think it's, it's a great question. And you see in many, for example, job posts, every employer now used the, um, we are an equal opportunity employer. Um, so it's, it's very well known and used out there. To me, um, in essence, uh, equal opportunity is a making a fair, giving a fair chance to everyone. Um, that is what it means. However, unfortunately, it's not necessarily linked to justice, because I think uh, in many situations, giving everyone a, an equal chance is not always identifying the diversities. Um, and the differences that we also need to approach and accommodate um, when we want to make a fair, give a fair chance to everyone. Mm -hmm. Kelly, what are your views? Before I answer, I'll say that um, there's no right answer. I don't think there's a right answer. And um, we need to continue to share what's happening internally, what's happening across our industry, if we, if we want to know what those best practices are. Um, Equal opportunity, I mean, how many, I, I've seen a lot of companies put their equal opportunity statement on, they say we welcome all, and then the next batch of CVs comes in and those people aren't a fit. And that's just, it's not equal opportunity, right? Because they, you know, we're talking a lot about they wouldn't fit our organization for one reason or another. And if you find yourself looking through CVs and you pick, you shortlist people and then they come in and you say that they're not a fit, I would suggest that's a you problem, not a them problem, because uh, you should be looking for what's adding. You've already thought about what you want in terms of skills. Um, and if they don't look right or act right or whatever that is, and they have the skills, then you'd probably need to take a few more steps back, right? And that's where we go wrong with equality of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Because we say we have it, but we don't. 
Yeah, I, I exactly agree. And I think also you, you mentioned also what is the, the challenges and what is uh, preventing uh, equal opportunity. And I think it's exactly what you say, that we have our okay. own idea of what we're looking for already. So just stating it, it's not fixing the problem. So I can name Rob a lot of different uh, areas that we also uh, are great topics within the DNI um, field, so um, unconscious biases and uh, leadership. I think leadership plays a huge role here. So if we want to accommodate and actually be uh, give, give people equal opportunity, that process of exactly <coughs> is selecting we need to look into. And I think uh, talking about unconscious bias, it's, it's, it's a huge topic. It's not something that we can just uh, be aware of and, and fix the problem. We just need to be more people involved and challenge all these mm -hmm. um, assumptions of what we're looking for. Um, and that will create better equal opportunity um, for the talent pool. It's strange because if we look at children in schools, and those that come from privileged backgrounds or underprivileged backgrounds, oftentimes the underprivileged um, don't do as well in school. That's statistically proven. And we throw money and we throw resources so that they get that equal opportunity, right? And then somehow as adults, that goes away. We don't, we don't recognize those um, uh, unequal um, situations and, and work towards making sure that you know, they do that equality of outcome happens. Mm -hmm. So with the aim to achieve equality of opportunity, many companies are now discussing the possibility of introducing uh, quotas. And for those of you who are not familiar with the term quota, it means that certain positions, a certain percentage of n or number of positions is allocated uh, for certain minority groups. So when we talk about equality of opportunity, many companies are actually thinking of it introducing uh, quotas. And usually the discussions are centered around gender, mm -hmm. gender quotas. So my question is, do you think, do you believe that uh, the introduction of gender quotas could address the issue of women's underrepresentation uh, within certain sectors of the iGaming industry and particularly in leadership positions? Kelly? I'll yeah. let you start. <laughs> um, I do. I think we don't. When we talk about quotas, there's also a term that goes with that, and that's positive discrimination, mm -hmm. which sounds like a dirty word that we don't, we would never want to discriminate, but every decision we make in our life is a discrimination, right? We, we can't know all the data, all the facts. We make choices based on those discriminations that we have, right? And oftentimes, uh, those stereotypes feed a lot of our choices and things like that, right? So if your company has made a intentional decision that you need more females within the business for whatever reason that is. Maybe your customer base is 50-50 female or uh, maybe no one's really challenging one another and you need new outside perspectives. If you've been intentional about that, then go and get it. You do it with everything else. Every strategic decision, you put targets and you go and get it. Now, where it goes wrong is that they don't think about that, right? You're not thinking about why you might need more females or more people from any underrepresented group, right? And what that means for your business. Again, back to my point about culture ad versus culture fit, right? Like, if you're not thinking about it, then yeah, it becomes a huge problem. Mm -hmm. And from our previous discussions, Ricky, I get uh, my understanding is that you're skeptical about the effectiveness of gender quotas. Why is that? What could be the challenges or the risks? Yeah, so um, I completely support this purpose. Um, we're working towards the same goal. Um, what I tend to focus more is, is the risk of using the quotas. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm in the, in the seat where I'm, I'm also working with recruitments and I'm very close with the organization. And what I'm, what I'm hearing is that people want um, to also be acknowledged for, um, of course, what they do. And I think one of the, the main arguments, you must have heard this a uh, thousand times, is that uh, people don't want to be put in a, in a seat only because there was a re seat reserved for them. They want to be um, hired and promoted based on their skills. Um, and what I'm focusing on a lot, and I think also is one of the most important parts about DNI, is to make, it, uh, make the workplace, the industry, uh, the societies, um, a nice place 
to be for everyone. So I want to create a, an organization where minority groups want to come, so make it attractive for them. And quotas, unfortunately, I don't think is the, um, is the tool to get to that goal. I think the focus must be elsewhere. Um, and I completely support having targets and saying we want to move towards this. But quotas to me is sending also some signals that could also scare away uh, the minority groups, unfortunately. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. I, I think all of us don't like the idea or it doesn't sit with, uh, well with us in some way, shape or form, but they work. Mm -hmm. They work. And if we're talking about the how and we still haven't decided on the how, it's an option, right? It is, if you want to get there in a framed amount of time, it works, right? And it, we don't like it because we might not benefit from it, right? Or we might already be in a position where oh, they might bring in someone who's not the right skills that I need or something like that because they have to meet their target. Mm -hmm. um, but they work. And, you know, there's loads of examples. Probably the most famous one, Dr. Brenda Murphy talks about it all the time, is South Africa. And when Nelson Mandela came into power, that they got those same arguments. They don't have the skills. They don't want to work in our industry. That sounds super familiar, doesn't it? Like, we, we don't have the talent. So instead of saying, okay, let's go, let's uh, make it friendly for people from other countries to come in, he said, let's give them the skills and the talent. None of you went to school for iGaming, I promise. <laughs> we all come in as a blank slate, right? Um, and we had the privilege of being sponsored and mentored and, and you know, into our job and in, in a place where we love what we do. And that's not unique. You know, we can bring in uh, any people and build the skills, and that actually makes us stronger as an industry overall. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Now, for instance, at Petsun, uh, as you know, we are very much focused on the topic of diversity and inclusion. We have been hosting conferences. We had three conferences over the past uh, couple of months. And we do have some uh, targets. Um, we, ha we are very diverse. We have over 65 nationalities. We have over 40% of women. We still have targets. And if you want to have a look at that, it's uh, part of our sustainability report, which is public. But today we said we are going to approach the topic from a slightly different perspective. Uh, so I would like to talk about the challenges. Let's, let's imagine that we do actually set quotas. We do actually set gender quotas. What could be the challenges or the risks? For instance, if we set gender quotas, should we also set quotas based on other diversity dimensions like age, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity and so on? And if we do that, what could be the potential challenges? Ricky? Yeah, so I think the task you mentioned is very complex and very difficult because, um, of course, we all also run businesses and that's also why we have our jobs. So, so of course, the purpose of why or the, the answer to why is, is, is key here. Um, so the, the big risk is, of course, to um, uh, exclude some minority groups because, um, yeah, we can say gender, that is, uh, I think, an, an obvious one and a very important one. Um, yesterday, I also listened to a very interesting um, uh, speech about neurodiversity. There are so many minority groups that we not necessarily identify we will need. Um, that putting these boxes up, I think, will only uh, take our focus away, um, which I see is one of the biggest risks of, um, mm -hmm. of having them and would be a very big challenge if you set the, these quotas to still, um, to still think inclusive. Okay. Kelly? Um, I think it starts well before we've made any decision to do quotas, right? So every, every company is very much individual in the culture they're building, in, in the markets they're going into, in the products that they offer. So you have to start with values, internal values. If, if inclusion is one of those values and making sure people do feel that they have a voice, they're contributing, and you look around and everyone looks like you, then yes, like if you're going to be intentional about saying we're, being inc we're inclusive, to people that look like us is, is not the case, right? So if it's counter to your value, your values are saying one thing and internally your culture is different, mm -hmm. 
you have a lot more work to do before you decide a quota is the right place to be. Now, there's loads of companies that have said, we're in Leeds, for example. Sky, um, I run an annual report and sort of uh, measure demographics of our industry. And Skybet um, scored the highest this particular year. They're in Leeds, which is a very, very diverse city in the UK, both socioeconomically, racially, and uh, they've got universities that are putting out as many women as they are men, right? So they're very, very diverse. Um, they want to be in Leeds, right? They want to be a member of the community in Leeds, and that's a core value for them, right? And so they do everything they can to reflect that community. That's a conscious decision, that's intentional, right? So they will have targets based on what they know, where the community they operate in. Um, oh. Others think it's it, good to purpose wash or um, it's, it's a nice bit of PR that we support diversity and inclusion. And look at us, we're gonna be 50-50 you know, by 2025 without sort of digging into those core values and sort of what you want to, you know, what kind of organization you want to be. So like I said, I think it starts well before um, hearing that, oh, McKinsey says it's good or whatever and deciding that you should do it too. Mm -hmm. So what, the, what I understand from this discussion is that we have different approaches. Some people are uh, in favor of gender quotas or any other form of quota um, and some people are against. Our goal is the same. Uh, we want to have equal and fair opportunities for all. The question is, how do we get there? Mm -hmm. And when it comes to actually using it as a PR, uh, thank you for mentioning this, Kelly, because uh, it leads me to my next question, <laughs> uh, which is, what I see nowadays is that there is a lot of focus on diversity and inclusion, and I'm personally very happy about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, as I said before, we are organizing all these conferences and we get other industry leaders to join us because this is an industry discussion we need to have, not a company one. Um, so one of my concerns is that uh, we often, if we focus exclusively on showcasing our diverse employees on social media, we are risking uh, using these individuals as tokens mm -hmm. and reproducing the very uh, stereotypes that we are meant to illuminate. So what do you think is the role of uh, social media in this? Kelly? Social media is huge. Um, media in general sort of paints the face for who we are as an industry. Um, it's a much better face in Malta than it is in the UK. The UK media is not so friendly um, to our industry. Um, but yeah, it is oftentimes, my co-founder Tina has a great slide about this sort of white family with an Asian kid photoshopped into it, right? And it just looks, I mean, we're trying to attract the next generation of Gen, Gen Z, you know, or younger millennials, and they see right through that, like, we're, you know, it's, it's very transparent the minute they walk in to an interview, right? It is very transparent that those people that they saw in your ad do not exist, or they might, but they're not coming to the interview because they're only for the PR. Mm -hmm. Ricky? Yeah, I completely agree there. I think um, from, from, from a media perspective, I think, again, with, with so much, you have to be authentic. And um, I think that that's if if you go via that um, route, I think you you would not do so much harm. Um, if you want to showcase a, a, a minor a person from a minority group, um, do it because this person has done something. It's not mm -hmm. because the person is from the minority group. I think it's okay to choose a person from a minority group and, and make a, a, an example in the media and, and use this, but as long as the, the purpose is because the person has done something. And of course, we are all performing in, in jobs, so I'm sure that that's possible as well. Um, I also believe that the media have a huge role. We know that role models also work as a, a very nice tool. Also, one of the reasons why quotas can be good because obviously, yeah, you need females there, and then more mm -hmm. organically, um, it reproduces uh, itself. Um, so the media is is a sh huge uh, important uh, factor that plays as well in 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 making sure that uh, we can also attract more diverse talents um, to the companies yeah. as well and the industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we had another panelist, Jake from iGaming Next, who was going to join us, but unfortunately he couldn't. But media is a really important piece of this. Not just trade media, but all the media. I mean, 
And I will say, in, in the six years we've been talking about DNI from Olin's perspective, they are the one sector that has made an intentional, conscious decision to be better, to, to get different perspectives, to have more people on the main stage. This is the first main stage I've ever been on talking about DNI, so that's amazing. But um, judging awards and making sure that the visible presence is there, right? And I haven't seen it to the extreme that the media has actually put that effort in, which you know I think is super important. We're seeing it in sports. There's all representations now when you look at sports commentators, you know, especially in, in American sports betting, right? When you look on TV, there's always a woman, there's always a person of color. It's not just a, a ex-coach that's, that's white, right, on, on screen anymore. So it's happening. Um, that's what people want to see because those are who the customers are. They want more, we all want more customers, you know? So make sure that your representation is authentic and that they are relatable to uh, who you want to have as customers or who you want to build a trust with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I also believe that um, yeah, you can do so much wrong, but you can do even more wrong by not doing anything. So I think it's, 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 it's fair to go about and say, yeah, okay, maybe our, um, I keep coming back to the agenda, it's, it's, it's not focusing on this it because it's, a, it's an easy example to take up. Um, if, if you have a, a lower representation of, of female, um, I think it's okay to, to represent that also, but still they are there and that, that does something and you can even also uh, include some kind of, yeah, we want to be more, could it be you or something like this? Just be, again, authentic, honest about uh, what we are uh, communicating. Mm -hmm. I think that um, that would also do something. Um, and just choosing the stock mm -hmm. images would, um, I think that that's a no-go uh, for mm -hmm. uh, especially... Uh, Please don't. Uh, no yeah. more stock images. <laughs> Take it down. <laughs> <laughs> no more hands with different colors in on the table either. <laughs> I think we could go on forever on this topic, but I would also like to give the opportunity to our audience um, to ask any questions they might have on the topic. We only have a couple of minutes, but there will be a QR code, uh, I believe. You can scan it and you can submit your questions on the topic. Yep, it's on the screen. While people are frantically typing um, their questions, because it's so, so interesting. Um, I also wanted to say that it is really important to involve your PR and marketing teams. Don't leave DNI to HR, it's for everyone. <laughs> And um, if you are going to be authentic, um, it's much like, you know, we're experiencing with responsible gambling. It's everyone's job. Um, it's ever, you know, and we see a lot in the data that we're collecting that it's switching from, okay, well, we have a policy of equal opportunity to, we're teaching people how to challenge behavior, how to know that this is a safe space, how to ask curious questions, how to elevate their employees um, and build their profile. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really positive step. Um, it's everyone's job um, in, you know, invite your C team, invite your marketing, invite your customer service because they are on the ground and they understand what your customers want and need and who they will trust. And would it be fair to say that our conclusion, regardless of the, the ways that we think are best to get there, is that we, we are not focused on the numbers. We're focused on the representation, making sure that everyone is given the same equal and fair opportunities. Uh, that they feel that they are treated fairly and that they belong to something. It's not about the numbers. Yeah, it's, it's hard enough to get people in this industry anyway. It's mm -hmm. like, keep them, like, make it a nice environment um, that they want to stay and contribute. Or, you know, like I said, no one studies this. We're not bringing in, you know, academic experts who know, you know, how to build better products, right? We're all learning ourselves. Um, if, and you don't have a voice, then you're, you're going to miss out on a lot of great ideas. Yeah, and I think also um, focusing on the numbers, I think this is such a long-term project and it's actually an yeah. never stopping. So if you're focusing on the numbers, you're going to get disappointed because they're not going to... Uh, yeah, I think it's an endless project. But it's yeah. always going to be evolving um, and that we will always be looking to and celebrating and wanting new perspectives. So it will always be there that we have to work mm -hmm. towards. Now, we have received a question from the audience. Um, I'll just read it out and see... So is there a link between authentic and your commercial growth? I think this is more linked to what Kelly was discussing about DNI being actually a, a driver of commercial growth. 
if you're not applying the same practices, if you say you value DNI and then we're going to put money on it and we're going to make it a strategic topic at our board, if you're not applying the same practices that you do to product development or human resources or whatever that may be, um, there won't be a link in any way. It, it is directly correlated. And the same if you're not thinking, being intentional, putting, you know, targets behind it, it just becomes a social conversation. And uh, there's, you know, that doesn't work if the company is not making money. Thank you. Now, we are running out of time, uh, so we have to wrap this up. Drawing on what Ricky said, I would like to finish with this. My personal... Uh, belief in this is that if we want something different, we have to do something different. Mm. Because if we keep on doing what we have been doing, we will be keep on getting what we're getting. So that's the, that's the message today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.